What is popping? Oh, or should I say, you're, that's a thing, a little bit. <laughs> you are here on this episode of Ask the Icon, the very first one. We're gonna shoot on to question number one. All right, so let me prepare myself and get ready because this is about to be something else. I feel like y'all threw some questions out there and um, I'm ready for it, real. Okay, so let's go on to it. Ty's mommy asks, your skin is gorgeous. What is your skincare regimen? You wanna know something? I honestly don't have a regimen. I really don't have a skincare routine that is regular that I follow. Um, now I do have like the things that I do do, but like there's not no specific, oh my God, I go get this product and this product. Honestly, I, when I know I need to pull this face together, I know what type of cleanser, what type of toner and a serum and different things I need to use. So, I mean, it's not like I have a regimen. I don't have a regimen, y'all. I just keep this cookie clean. And I eat right a little bit. I mean, I don't dig into the pork. I eat a little bit of beef, fried foods. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah, vegetables, I stick to my things. But sodas, I don't do sugary things like that. I'm not a candy man like that, but water is my deal. Or you're going to find me with a drink in my hand with some ginger ale. So, yeah, no routine, no regimen. I just really make sure that I keep this face clear by washing, cleaning, and doing the, the steps that I need to follow to keep this skin and this cookie baked. <laughs> All right, let's scoop on to the next question. And by the way, if you still have some questions, send them on through because we may just shoot this on to the next episode. So don't be afraid, all right? So let's keep it going. Brandon asks, how do you view the differences in the way that black gay culture is being exploited versus white gay culture? Oh, this is a very unique one. So, I mean, I feel like if you think about it, right? Think of the times when a uh, specific you know, areas of communities become popular. You know, everybody kind of wants a bit and a piece. And I was actually just watching this video yesterday, by the way, I am a YouTuber and I like to watch a whole bunch of documentaries documentaries, and random videos. So uh, I just get a lot of knowledge coming this way. So again, um, definitely when it comes to marginalized cultures, it's the best thing to do is always make sure you are in tune with the people who are part of the culture who are in it and who are doing the things definitely at that moment so you can get the real true thing now we we feel like things get exploited all the time if you think about how when you you know go back in the day and you hear how songs went from you know one specific uh you know culture to the next and it, it shifted and then you know one culture talks about it and, and says how much of it is it their culture but you know it, it it's it's going to be an ongoing thing this is why i said you have to make sure that you stick to the people who are doing the actual things when it comes to the culture so you realize who is appropriating and appreciating what's happening during that time so um, it takes a lot of us to put the work in and make sure that everyone knows and is educated and informed about things and how we're supposed to move forward and also uh, keep hold of, of your culture because baby, I got a hold of mine. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. That was cute. Oh, you came, bit. You came for it. Okay. Let's shoot on over to Joe. And by the way, these Ask the Icon questions are pretty cool. I mean, maybe I need to get more in depth songs for like I'm just like going through them because they coming, baby. Okay. So, Joe asks, which artist or artist, if any, inspires you to do what you are doing with your career today? Okay, so my friend's kind of like, you know, I don't care. You know, I tell you who my artists are, and one of my favorite artists, and as a kid and still as an adult, is Cisco. He inspired me boots. Now, I know some people, you know, the young kids probably don't know who Cisco is, but you know, the people doing my time and a little bit before, I lived with Cisco. I was a big fan. He inspired me definitely during his specific time in his reign, he was doing his thing and I was there for it. I'm still here for it now and I follow him and I be hitting him up and everything like that. But you know, Cisco's one of those people. Um, I'm a Beyonce stan, I'm gonna be honest. So yes. Beyonce is one of those artists who inspires me, um, fellow Virgo. Ow. Um, you know, I, you could just tell that she's a hard worker and she puts so much into it and she's so focused and dedicated, make sure everything is there. And I'm, I'm, I watch it like, uh, shockingly enough, in the beginning when Beyonce first ever came out, my best friends were like bigger fans and I didn't know Beyonce. So I'm like, who is a Beyonce? And once that happened, done, that was it. Um, any other artist or anyone, I mean, I love the creativity that Rihanna has or and, and definitely the drive. Oh, baby, Rihanna doesn't play. Um, and one more 
person I add on this list. Shockingly enough, uh, I had an opportunity to meet this man um, on one of the seasons of Legendary, which was season one, and Tyson Beckford. I look up to him, him he's a very beautiful, attractive black man. Like, and you know, I wanted to, okay, I used to model y'all. I used to model. So he was one of the people I was kind of like getting my inspiration, motivation from by seeing everything he was doing when I was a kid. And I had the opportunity to see him and it was friggin' awesome. And he's cool as hell, by the way, he's cool as hell. But um, that's another artist who inspires me. And again, you know, different fields, different waves. And I, I that's how I sit in this model form I'm in right now. So cool. Okay. Let's shoot on to the next question. Um, okay, so S Dub asks, and you feel like a dancer from this question. Okay, I've noticed that there are a lot of hip hop contemporary dance elements in your Vogue. Oh, somebody's watching me. You clearly have so many different styles of dance and you can pull from when you are hired and are trying to choreograph for different artists and projects. Well, okay. Somebody been watching me. Okay. That means you've been seeing the things I've been doing. So how do you feel about choreographers that have been to be members of the ballroom community? Um, it's very unique to have members of the ballroom community because, you know, everybody has their own specific style of dance. I think for me, I'm from, well, I'll start off with this, this, the, the elements and how I involved my Vogue and took my experience and applied it. Uh, for me, I'm from Brooklyn, New York City. Um, basically, I was a hip hop dancer prior before becoming a Vogue dancer. And I have to tell you, because baby, when I found Voguing at 14, I can tell you, I forgot everything that I had about my hip hop history. And if you know me, if you know the whole deal, right? I'm from Brooklyn, New York City. I used to live in the projects. Yes, baby, I was raised in the hood. Um, we used to have our project days. And I was from Brownsville, so they had Brownsville Day. And I also stayed in Tompkins, too, so they had Tompkins Day. But they was never on the same day. So my background and history of my hip-hop style or the things that I've learned from my dancing back then has applied to my voguing. And it's, it's basically... What you do is apply what you know to the Vogue and, and put your own essence so people can understand who you are and what you do. So what you have been seeing is my background being applied to my Vogue. And uh, that's a really good question. And it, one thing about it, and I, I also felt, you know, because of the whole dance world and the dance style, of course, is a, uh, uh, is a lifestyle when it comes to voguing. You know, I know people say it's a dance style, but maybe this is a lifestyle because a lot of stuff that you have to apply yourself into this in order to really get it right. So I find it very beautiful when I see people from the Balm community who are choreographing, definitely because they have the right information for my community to express that or inform others and, and make sure that the right things are going forward. So I think it's beautiful to see my, my kin, my people get booked as choreographers and, and teaching the right things because sometimes people have more knowledge than what we believe in. And if you want to be technical and honest, a lot of people learn a lot of dance styles before they learn voguing. Now, voguing is, is it right now because I see kids voguing down, but like, you know, you apply what you know and that's how it all becomes one. And then, you know, so shout out to that. Thanks, S-Dub. Oh, stop watching me. <laughs> We're going to move on to a question that Cedric asked, okay? So I've attended a couple of balls and I definitely enjoyed the experience. Coming from a small city, the ballroom scene wasn't a big thing. Thanks to Pose and Legendary, I was able to see more of the scene. Okay, so your question is, to join a house is participating in a ball requirement. If so, if the interested party isn't familiar with the different categories, will they be taught? Look, I'll tell you this. It's either there's different ways of understanding how ballroom works. Um, sometimes people are introduced to it by others. Sometimes people stumble upon it. Um, sometimes people kind of like, uh, you know, you, you just have this, this vibe of just knowing what you want when you do it. Um, and one thing I can say is like when it comes to different categories, a lot of people can be taught a category. Some categories you have to naturally have, though, because some things can't be taught. And if you ever seen Legendary Season 1 when Erica says, if you have to practice space, you ain't got it. <laughs> Cause you gotta have it, baby. So yes, you could be taught certain categories specifically if you want to get there. And I'm not saying if you don't have, you know, if you don't got face, I'm not saying like you can't do what you gotta do to get there. But baby, that's one of the hardest processes. 
But um, you can learn different categories like runway and go to practice and rehearsals. And if someone sees you for that category in the house, they're going to make sure that you stick to that category. So, yeah, nine times out of 10, if you run into a ballroom person and they see you within that first five seconds, they're going to know your category. So if you don't know what you want to do, they're going to tell you what you're going to do. And if they don't have a category for you to for you to do and you can find one, that'd be great. And sometimes you do have some people there who don't have categories and it's kind of tough. But baby, that's why they just remain spectators. So um, it can be taught, but not many things can be taught. It should be a natural thing from here. Like I said earlier, it's a lifestyle, baby. And if you don't know how to apply yourself to this lifestyle, I, I should think you should just continue to spectate. No, Sade. Okay, we're going to move on. Kay asks, I love you in your Vogue. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> Just wanted you to know who is your Vogue inspiration and who is your favorite femme queen and butch queen performers. Okay. I like this question because I'm asked this often about who is my favorite performers. Definitely when it comes to femme queens and butch queens. And for those who do not know what femme queens and butch queens are, usually we identify our trans women as being femme queens inside our community. And butch queens are really uh, identifying gay males cool now uh things has changed i'm not saying that's how it goes right now i don't want no problem no situations just making it very clear okay inside our community that's how we address our uh our men in our category or our male figures is butch queens and um our trans women is femme queens so my favorite femme queen performer uh is yolanda you know god bless her soul baby she was one of the first people i ever seen and she just had this aura about her that just sleek you know oh it was just so rich so good so unbothered and i love yolanda about that so she's my favorite femme queen performer if you ever want to check her out just go type in yolanda jordan or y yolanda and just put vogue in and you'll find anything you need um my favorite butch queen performer it changes up for me sometimes it really does. And I, I can honestly say my favorite femme queen performer changes up as well, too. But my favorite ever is Yolanda. I don't think I have, have a favorite butch queen like that. If I would give it to someone that I, that inspired me or gave me the, the juice to, you know, also participate in the category when it was like really doing it was Mystery Dior. And he was like the, a dramatic butch queen. One of the first dramatic butch queens I met when I found out about voguing in he just had this vibe about him. I liked it. He commentated. He vogue down dramatic. Uh, so he was really cool. And he was cool with everyone. So those are my favorite femme queen and butch queen performers. And I know they're old school. So if you should have said new school, I would have gave you that one too. But that's my vibe right now. So thank you, Kay. <laughs> As we move on to the next question, we go to Cortez Riley. So Cortez Riley, he says... Compared to what ballroom meant to you when you first began walking balls, how has ballroom significance to you evolved over the years? Okay, I'm going to be completely real about this. And thank you, Cortez, because this is something very interesting that I explain to everybody, definitely in my voguing classes when I teach. Walking balls were completely different then than it is now. Again, we were underground years ago. And, it, you know... It, Many people didn't know about us. We didn't have the YouTubes. We didn't have all the other jazz. Yes, we had ways of communicating with, with each other, but that was our world. So walking balls, then, it, it, you know, you got the real good walkers. The people who walked the category knew that's what they wanted to walk, and they were all good. And yes, of course, you had a few people who, you know, weren't like winning grand prizes like that all the time, but they were still as naturally good in their category than what it is today. Nowadays, I feel like it's so open to ballroom uh, for anyone to participate in whatever category they feel they can go to. And that's the difference between then and now. Then you kind of really stuck to the categories that you walked and that you were good at and you didn't did any, do anything else. You didn't walk on any other category. And then if your house parents were really good at you, they made sure that you only walked that one category. And if you were good at something else, maybe you test it out, but you stick to that one category. Now I feel like people come to balls and they're just like, oh my God, I like runway, let me walk. Oh my God, I want to Vogue because I like the Vogue. Oh my God, I think I can walk best dressed. And it's really not that easy. And that's why I said the difference between then and now is that like the people who knew they were good and knew they, who, what their categories were, they participated and they did it. So it evolved over the years. I'm not mad because, you know, it's changed. This is a, a community that has generational changes. And 
I'm glad enough that you're able to see it because we have a Paris is burning. We have a how do I look? We have a pole. We have a legendary and you get to see the shift that's happening right now. And it's not going to stop. So just get ready for it to change more. So thank you, Cortez. Riley. <laughs> I, I like ask the icon because you just don't know what you're going to get. And you may see a friend or just someone random who's been watching you for so many years. Oh, Caesar, a.k.a. Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> I know who this is. What what you gonna say? Cause this is something. Okay, hear this out. This is a story. I just wanna say how proud of you I am. Oh, I remember our days being messy, reading each other at McDonald's in the village. <laughs> Laugh out loud. We were just kids, but look at you now. My heart was warmed all the way up to watching you on Legendary Impose. I'm very low key, so no need to shout me out. Oh, too late now, Kenta. But I just wanted to make sure you got this message. I'm not on social media much, but I'm not on social media much. But please follow me back on Insta. Oh, Rockstar ATL. So we can stay in touch. So happy for you. Keep being beautiful all the way around. Oh, Kendall, that was sweet. Can I tell you that moment was at McDonald's? <laughs> uh, baby, okay, listen. In the village, I came out at a very young age. So I was, you know, hanging out in the streets. You know, I did what I had to do. I went to school, made sure my work was good. But I was hanging out at night in the, in the village. And there was this one place on West 4th Street that had McDonald's and Burger King right next to each other. And all the young gay girls used to go to McDonald's on West 4th Street. And this had to be about, oh, gosh, 99, 2000. Oh, oh, oh. aging number to number. But we used to all just go in McDonald's and just sit and talk and laugh and kiki and read and go through all of this. I wonder what the workers were going through. I should do like a little video docu-series on it, like what it was to go through McDonald's on West Wall Street because it was so interesting. I can imagine what the straight people were seeing what, back in 99 when we we're just like taking open McDonald's at like 12 o'clock in the morning. Baby, we used to have so much fun. So that McDonald's in the village, if you were out during that time and you were around, not saying you had to be a part of the ballroom coach, but it was just a West Village thing during that time. It was McDonald's. And after you finish your McDonald's, you walk down to Christopher Street and go kiki with your girlfriend. So, ah, Kendall, love you, baby. I got you. I'm going to follow that with my heart. Okay. Daryl asks, who is your designer? Oh. Well, I have a great lineup of amazing designers and stylists who I work with. Um, I can also tell you I have amazing people who are in my life who has given me the opportunity to step up and, you know, get into the world of my style. I also, I, I want to be completely real about this. I, I feel like, you know, Everyone wants to have the latest things, the, the the beautiful outfits, the you know, the latest brands on. And for me, I felt like I wanted to take my time until I got there. I didn't want to kind of spend my heart on money when I was a kid on outfits and clothes. And I didn't have no understanding about it. And now today, I feel like my understanding about fashion is much different. And I'm able to connect to those out there to, you know, enlighten me or give me information or even see the difference of what I needed about clothes. And I will shout Eric Archibald. He was one of my amazing gurus. By the way, iconic Eric Milan. <laughs> but Eric Archibald, all baby stylists of all stylists from the Barn Singing community as well too. But he's one of those who really gave me the, you know, the fashion one-on-one, what I need. And it, I think his personality makes sure you get that as well too. So if you know Eric, you know he gonna give it to you. <laughs> But um, I, again, a plethora of people who helped me kind of get my vision and put it out there so you guys can kind of like, you know, do the thing. So thank you, Daryl. Hope you got it. Linux asks, because we're going on to the next question. Can you give me some tips for someone entering the ballroom scene for the first time? Girl, it, it's, it's unique. Because I can't say you're going to have a great time and it's a loving world and you're going to find a family and da 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 I completely tell everyone this. Everyone's ballroom journey is much different. And I mentioned earlier, sometimes people, people bring you along to this. People bring you into this. People, you know, you find something and you do, you do like and you just go for it. Um, my tip I would give you is look at every house. Figure out what house moves you. 
figure out what house speaks your language. And sometimes you can see that with just the vision. And then if once you find that house or if you got a, a few number of houses, see what their people are like and see if that's something you want to do. When it comes to categories, here's my tips. Do not be walking out there, walking a category and you are not informed about it. The MC commentators, that just give them the space to read the shit out of you. <laughs> so if you're going to participate in a category, Make sure that they have either virgin or they call them for new kids to participate in it. Or if you feel like you're really good that you can devour the ones who are already eating it, go out there and do it. But do not put your behind out there and go walk a category because if I'm commentating, shall I'm reading. So, you know, make sure you know your categories. And as far as when it comes to the atmosphere, I always say, figure out what you like about it and keep doing it. Thank you, Linux. Am. Okay. Uh, oh, crap. Here we go with these questions. You know, I was waiting for this. I was waiting for a question like this to come. Angelica White asks, how do you feel about HBO Max canceling Legendary? Um, I could be honest. I, every good thing comes to an end. And I said this before, as you hear, in my Legendary Confessions. And it's sort of like when I was the actor on Pose, you know, Things cancel, things change, things have its longevity, you know, shows have its place. And, you know, I'm just happy that my community had opportunity to be in the mix. That's what I'm happy about. So, I, I, yes, I wish it would continuously go on. And which I said earlier, I feel like we're on vacation anyway, so don't worry about it. But I'm, I'm excited that, you know, my community can sit and look at the artists that they once look up to and perform in front of them or perform in front of the world and, and have this opportunity. Again, when I first started in this community, we didn't have nothing like this. Um, and now that there's something for us to speak in, in the spaces, so we're going to be there speaking. So, uh, yes, that's heard, but ain't mad. I, I'm not mad at it at all. And I feel like it's more to come. This community is so big and we do so many things. And I, I want you to know, I, I want people to understand my life has been going on prior before this with the amazing things I've been doing. And with this, my thing's going to be so amazing after. So, baby, just wait, because we got more to come. <laughs> Thank you, Angelica. Okay. Let's move on. This, these Ask the Icon questions are like, oh my gosh, y'all are coming through with them now. I'm starting to get a little nervous. I feel like my blood pressure going to go up. Okay. Dominique Mercer asks, hi, Father Bosky. Hey, boo. What's up? Bosky, skeet, motherfucker. Okay. I wanted to know, how did you get into the ballroom house? Into a ballroom house. I've been watching ballroom and legendary for a while now and always wanted to be a part of a house. Dominique. How do you join a ballroom house? How do you get into it? Like I said, there are ways you can have a person pull you in and go through that way. And now the process is much different for everybody. I'm not saying every house does this the same. So again, usually if they have a recruitment team that's going to help you get involved and understand the house, sometimes that works. Sometimes you have one person who's going to help you know everything you need to know about that house so you can join it. Um, find the house that works for you, not the house that looks cute, because if you just join the house that looks cute, sometimes that's not the best deal. And then you, you start your journey with a bad path. <laughs> I'm just saying. So be very mindful about the first house you choose. And it's really not difficult. And if you really see where you want to be and you let them know, this is where I want to be, then everything else is in the air. So it's not, at, not difficult, but Really surround yourself around those you want to be with, and you can join the house you want. Cool. Thanks, somebody. Okay, let's move on to Trisha Andrews. And she asks, what ballroom poses do you think Dolly Parton would slay him? <laughs> Dolly Parton, oh my gosh. If she did poses, I'm going to answer this. What ballroom poses? Okay. I feel like Dolly Parton would be good in like a fashion category. And her poses would be like, you know, a rich, you know, unbothered woman with her labels and pieces and, and jewelry and shiny things on. And uh, I think her pose is it's so interesting because I would have to get up and do, do it. But like, I feel like she would be in a striking pose with a hand on her hip and like the left leg out with a, a beautiful, you know, pump. 
And, you know, Dolly love a, a, a good old gown. So throw on the gown, let her, her, her do her thing, and a good old bouffant that's blonde, and uh, her face is done. And I just feel like she's just there with an attitude, hand on the hip, foot pointed, toe, like, on a course. Like, she she just would do, for me, a fashion category. Yeah, yeah. With those fashion poses. So it, it exists. Thank you, Trisha. That was unique. Wow, Dolly Parton. That was, that was different. I've never been asked anything like that. I mean, it would be shockingly enough if she was a joint of all scene and walker category. So if she does, Dolly, we're waiting for you. <laughs> okay, let's move forward. Corey B. Ask, hey, Icon, what's good? <laughs> I'm a photographer from Philly. And ever since I saw you, I've been obsessed with your look. Ooh. Why are you so obsessed with me? Boy, I won. Okay. <laughs> um, and that face. Thank you. So my question is, when can I get the chance to photograph? Oh, you want to photograph me and make, and you want to be my personal photographer? All right. Wait, I was just in Philly not too long ago, Corey B. Um, first of all, what you should do is send that information right on to the team. Make sure I got the full dose of what you do, how you do it. Let me see how you shoot. Are you good on black skin because you like this face and you're obsessed with this look? So that means you should know how to shoot the king. Ah. Um, Corey, hit me up. I mean, I ain't mad at that. So, um, yeah, you can get a chance to shoot me. If the work is good, you got me. I, Corey, okay. I'm obsessed. <laughs> Let's move this forward. Okay. We're going to go to Bjorn. And Bjorn asks, I like to know how much the epic series Pose, one of my favorite shows on streaming TV ever, reflects the reality of ballroom since of the late 80s and 90s, since usually Hollywood is interfering a lot on TV nowadays. Okay, and on that note, I adore you whole cast so much. Okay, thank you so much, Bajoran. Okay, you, what you wanna know, right, is how did Pose reflect on what the ballroom scene was going on during that time? Oh, baby, it hit it on the nose. It was on point. It was like, you have to understand each episode was told from details of people from the culture. They had a whole bunch of consultants from the community who, you know, shout out to those who've been walking balls since the 80s and 70s. We even go back to the 60s, child. But for those who are still here today, we have an opportunity to, you know, talk and speak and have these shows put to you. I'll give you an example. If you are a Pose watcher, there was an episode where they went inside the museum and robbed the museum and then walked the ball and, you know, everybody got arrested and left the function. That really happened. Like, the girls really went to the museum. They stole everything. They walked the ball and got arrested at the function. But that's the thing about when I tell you about balls. It's like you, when you do it, whatever it takes to get that grand prize, you're going to go for it. And sometimes you got to, people in the ballroom scene like to, like to kind of overdo you. They like that one up you. That's what it is. They like to one up you in this community. And it's, if you got something exclusive that nobody else has, baby, I'm going to go out there and celebrate it. And who and a right mom was going to walk a function with outfits from a museum that's supposed to be untouched someone from the community. So yes, it, it, it depicted real situations that occurred from the community because the consultants were the exact ones who were telling the stories. Oh, thank you, by the way. That was a good question. Um, how do y'all think I'm going so far? Yeah, think it's cool? Am I right? Okay, all right. Uh, okay, cool. Let's move on to the next question. Oh, this ass the icon. I'm liking it. All right. Yard Bella asked, I want to know what are your top three gag worthy moments from each season? Oh, Chelsea, Yarda, you should have been real specific. You could have said legendary or, or pose. I was on both shows. So I'm going to, I'm going to hope you talk about legendary right now, Yard Bella. And I'll tell you each one of my gag worthy moments from each season. Season one, my gag worthy moment, I honestly would have to say, Oh, Dominique Jackson. When Dominique and Law got into it, I, I keep explaining to people, and you probably hear in my legendary confessions if you go to it, when you got that IFP in your ear 
and it, you know when you got to hear from you know the producers and everything and they have to talk to you when dominique and law was going through this situation the producers were in my ear like Deshaun, we need to pull it together we're running out of time it is over midnight we got to get everybody out of here blah, blah, blah. and i'm sitting here listening as they are going at it and i have to do my job y'all have to understand that was a gag worthy moment to do my job and do well it's not as difficult but because in the ballroom scene when you got to pull it together you got to pull it together so what i did was do the thing that they would naturally do and pull that shit together it was gag worthy because i had producers in my ear had the audience screaming i had the judges going off i had the contestants like what the hell is happening and they're like they sean pull it together a job of an MC is not good. I want y'all to know that it's so much into it. So season one, gag worthy moment had to be Dominique. Season two, my gag worthy moment, baby, when the, I have to say, Law and Simone. I think everyone is about Law. <laughs> Each one includes Law. So season two, Law and Simone. Oh, baby, they got into it back and forth. And she came back, started reading the judges and laws like, no, baby, da, da, da. And I'm there like, holy crap. And sometimes when the contestants got upset and got over it and they were just not feeling what the judges were saying, they would just walk off. And no, Sade, what the judges would do is let them know how they felt with, about you walking off or with what was going on in the situation. So the gag worthy moments of knowing that, you know, anything can happen at any moment. Season two was like a Simone Tishi. And that's when they got eliminated, right? Oh, yes, it was. Child, a T-She's being eliminated. That's exactly what it was. That's what it was. So that was a gag-worthy moment because when they were going home, I think at that moment, I was present saying, when this show comes on, oh, God, they are not going to watch any episode after this. <laughs> they are going to, like, turn this off because people love the T-She's, and that sent the world in a frenzy when it came out. And I kind of knew it when we were shooting, so that was that. So season two, see, she's being sent home. Season three, baby. Now, season three had a lot of gag worthy moments, but the Machiavelli, he's the house of Machiavelli and law. <laughs> when uh, one of the members from the house of Machiavelli told law, I'll see you outside because of the critique. And then law waited till they came back on stage and it was a reading match back and forth. Law was like, no, 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 no. She could tell me. No, let her tell me. I'm from Chicago. I got this. I was like, holy shit. I was, to be honest, it's my gag worthy moments. If you go back to these moments, you'll see my reaction. I'm like, oh, oh, you'll see me. Oh, I have to add one more gag worthy moment. When Naomi gave that three to a house, I forgot what house she gave that three to. But if, if you see me, I was like, well, bitch, where the hell that three come from? <laughs> gag worthy moments. Those are those. Yard Bella, thank you for that one because, ooh, it's much more, but those are the gag worthies. Okay, let's move on to the next one. And Chris, this looks like a good one because you got ones and twos. You got part ones and twos. So Chris J in LA asks, I have two questions for your podcast. Oh, thank you. Let's read them. The first one is, for Legendary Season 1 and 2, which team would you have thrown a gag flag for? Oh. It's so interesting enough, I'm going to answer this. And I have to be really real. I kept it honest publicly that I did not show my feelings when it came to each and every house, including my own, that was on this show. So you never got my personal feelings about how I felt and what was going on in performances. I, I treated everybody the same. They got the equal love. Cool. So season one and season two. Who would I throw in a gag flag in for season two? Y'all know I'm going to say my house, right? When I was in that house. But I couldn't have thrown a, a gag flag because it was at the end. So I had to pick a house that got eliminated. No, Sade. I know what house I would throw the gag flag in for season one. And I think I would throw the gag flag in for the House of West. And here's why. I feel out. Like I feel like because of the first season of this show, that was our trial run. That was our test run. That was us getting an opportunity to 
show the world that we have a show that's much different than everything else that's going on out there. And I feel like the House of West didn't get the opportunity to express that. I feel like they had like this small little bits here, but like, I, I feel like the West would have did more. So I kind of would have threw my gag flag in for the West. And plus during that time, there were a new house that was pulling it together. And the West today are, are a house that you do not want to play with. So season one, mom will go in for the House of West. Season two, I'm on a limb with it. I'm on a limb. And here's why I'm on a limb. Because immediately, I want to say the house of Tishi. I want to say the house of Tishi should have got the gag flag. And that will be my first choice if I set one. But again, I I kind of have a, a two more, possibly. And here's why. I say Tishi because, baby, as soon as they're eliminated, we, we feel like you know, some was taken away when the T-Shoes got eliminated and it, people felt that by watching it. And when a good house goes, it kind of makes you look at the other houses like, child, what are they good at? You know, that's what it, the, the vibe gives. So um, I know people felt that because they expressed it to me. So t -she. But to be honest, I feel like the Muir Vasai and Prodigy didn't have a chance either. So they probably would be in the mix if I had a, another option. So, but mine would be t -she. Now, your second part to your question is, if you could assemble a super team composed of any five members from any house from all three seasons of Legendary. Who would you put on it? With no more than one member of Boskin. <laughs> you had to put that in parentheses, huh? Okay, if I was to assemble a team from every season, this is hard because I got to think about that. But if I was to go off the whim, who would I want? Who would I want? Who would I want? If I was to say someone from season one, Throw Michaela in the mix. Everyone loved Michaela. I, I feel like Michaela was like one of those fan favorites. And, you know, I would throw Michaela in the mix. A uh, season two, I will put someone like, uh, let me think the houses that are out there. Um, shockingly enough, I would put Malik from the house of Miyaki Mugler. I will put Shannon Balenciaga to mix everything up. <laughs> you got to mix everything up. I would put from season three, I think I would put, oh gosh, this is hard. This is why this question is so interesting. Season, okay. So, oh gosh, Michaela was from my house now, so I can't put nobody else, right? God dang it. I was going to say a Basquiat, but she's a Basquiat, so I can't do that. Um, I want to put a runway person in there, so I'm going to put Kiona Revlon from the House of Revlon. I want to put, uh, I got the face deal, which is Shannon, um, and I'm going to put a sexy boy up in there. And from the list of our sexy men from the season, how everyone was saying it um, publicly, I think I'm going to throw Diego in the mix. So that'll be my five. Oh, wait, 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 wait. All three, da da da. Okay, yeah, I could do that. You just said no one person from my house. Cool, I put two from another house. <laughs> and that's just me going off the whim. I'm just typing off the whim. Now, if I was to think about it, it probably would be different. So thank you, Chris J in LA. Woo, that was lengthy, bitch. <laughs> All right, let's see what Diddy asked. Being a father of a legendary house, what is the criteria you look for when choosing members of your house? A revered elder? I think you are one of the few people who will really guide me well. So thank you for your incredible work and your beautiful self. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, Didi, um, what do I look for when choosing members? Oh, wow. Oh, am I spilling my... No, I'm going to tell you because I may just find a member out there. So I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an undeniable person. I'm looking for disruption in a good way because some people don't know. It's so easy to get people's attention and you don't have to do much to do it. And you can get people's attention in such a positive way. So I love disruption. Um, like I said, undeniable, disruptive, and oh shit, I, I have something with this. Undeniable, disruptive, oh, and unpredictable. One thing that is so makes a, a person who they are when you can't predict what they're going to do next. So if you are unpredictable and you got it in you to come out on this floor and be in this house and represent in such a way that people are so excited when they see you because they know that you're going to put on a show, 
I'm here for that. And I'm always looking for family. I'm always looking for you being the best at your category because I find the good ones. And I'm also saying that, you know, I'm not in a quick rush to throw everybody in the house because I'm very selective when it comes to Basquiat. And my house members don't play any games too. But once you are part of this crown kingdom, it's amazing. Now, when it comes to a revered elder, someone who's been doing it for a long time, usually, you know, I mean, when it comes to elders, those who are either doing it before me or during my time or a little bit after who's been doing it for quite some time, I usually say, you know, take your knowledge that you're going to give to others that come inside this house because you as a newbie would love information from someone who's been a part of it for quite some time. So the, the exchange is really good. So I like the elders who like to give the knowledge and help out and also still eat that ballroom floor the fuck alive. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want. I want those who are going to go out there and represent Bosque, motherfucker, like it needs to be, okay? Because every house has that, and I got mine. So thank you, Dee Dee. Mm, probably want to join my house after this, huh? <laughs> okay, let's move on to Dave's question. Okay, so he says, Dave Sean, thank you for the show and just everything you do. You're welcome, darling. <laughs> I'm not in the ballroom community, but Legendary really did touch me in the soul. Aww. I'm really glad there are other ways to follow and appreciate ballroom online now. That's really decent and cool. And I listen to you on Spotify audio only. Oh, you listen to me on Spotify. Shout out to those who listen to me on Spotify, Apple, and just, you know, just hearing the voice. You know, that, that, that that's a thing. You have to imagine what I look like as you're <laughs> listening to it. So what does your voice sound like to you? How does it sound to you in your head? How does that differ from what you hear when you listen to your podcast recordings? Ooh, and a bonus question. What kind of cartoon animal do you think you could really nail with that voice? Okay, 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 okay. Okay, Dave, let's go with the first one. What does your voice sound like to you? Oh. Um, to me, I feel like my voice, it has this, I'm real pitchy. I'm pitchy. I can be a high, deep voice, a high tone lapper, and I can have this deep baritone situation. I just feel like my, my voice fluctuates. So um, I like my voice. I feel like my voice sounds sexy to me. Um, to be honest, I, I, I've, <laughs> I got a story. Okay. Okay. I, I feel like my voice changed when I was a kid, right? Before, you know, puberty kicked in for me, I had a high ass voice. It was really, really, really high, high and pitchy. And I remember one time, you know, I, yes, I was like one of those little gay black kids in the park playing with the girls. And I had boys who was friends too, but I was playing with the girls a lot of time. And one day my mother was watching me. Oh, and I was being like a little old child. I was doing the most. And she called me up and she sat me down in the park and he and my brother playing basketball and I'm playing with the girls. Um, and she heard me yelling and screaming and playing. Blah, blah, blah. She came over and she's like, go play with your, your, your friends over there. What you doing? You know how that was during the time. If you had family like that, they were doing that. So go play with your boy, your friends over there with little boys. Don't stop playing with those girls. And she said, put some bass in your voice. Baby, after she said, put some bass in your voice, I think she asked for a lot because literally a week after it kicked in and she was like, I need you to add some trouble because this bass is a little too damn much. And now it it actually, actually works out. So um, I love my voice. How does it sound to you in your head? Um, okay, I learned this. I've took voiceover classes before, and usually they say the voice that you hear in your head is different from what you actually hear when you hear it. So the voice in my head is different in different spaces for me. So on my podcast, I love it. I love this, you know, hear what I sound like. I play it on my TV. I play it in a car. I play it everywhere. I love to to get the vibe of what it is. Um, same with like when it comes to like legendary and stuff like that. I love to see myself hear my voice and all that jazz. I think it's very different because I know my my what I can do better. So when I hear myself, I'm always like, damn, Deshaun, you should have said that word different. Damn, Deshaun, you should have mentioned that. Oh, child, you could have read her and you ain't say nothing. But uh, again, it, it differs. Now, it's so interesting because when I hear my voice in my head, when I'm I feel like I'm a singer sometimes, y'all. If I'm a singer, I'm a rapper. I do it all. So my singing and rapper voice in my head is fab. 
recording it. I'm like, oh, baby, he needs some work. <laughs> it's good. I just like, you know, it's, it's so much different. So it, it, it's different. And I, I love it on my podcast. And you ask this bonus question. I like bonus questions. No Sade. And I like <laughs> and this one. It's cool. What kind of cartoon animal do you think you could really nail with that voice? Something is popping up for me. Um, I feel like I don't have that that playful kind of like a cheery voice. I feel like my voice puts me in an evil doer. I feel like my voice kind of puts me in like an evil doer villain kind of situation. So um, to be honest, I feel like I'll be maybe a, a mean lion. You know, yeah, it, Scar comes up. <laughs> I don't know why Scar comes up, but it's the voice, is the yeah, oh, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you you won't be able to. Uh, I, I feel like, yeah, they'll throw me as like a, a really mean lion or a tiger. Or a mean panther. Yeah, one in one of the cat worlds. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Woo! Clint Okayama. OMG. Okay, now I'm going to go through this. I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this through because this, this is... It's a lengthy one, but I'm, I'm going to go through it, okay? So, Clint Okayama asks, Deshaun, whenever somebody asks me for the greatest Vogue clips of all time, I tell them to look up your clips on Ballroom Throwbacks. Oh, shit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no shade. By the way, if you want to look at some Ballroom clips and you want to see what's going on with Ballroom and what's happening now and, and, and the balls that are really occurring, you can go to YouTube on Ballroom Throwbacks and catch the latest Ballroom event that happened. And you see each and every category in clip. Shout out to Caesar Ballroom Throwbacks from the House of Alpha Omega. Boom. So Clint says, I'm creating deeply affordable age and community independent apartments for LGBTQ elders, activists, icons across New York City. I'll be personally renovating their apartments to their preference so that it's both safe and always nice, no matter their age or physical ability. Baby, if you tell the New York City girls that, those icons and those activists and elders, they just may be on your ass, Clint, okay? Because, chap, I was in New York City. Clint, come to my house and fix this. <laughs> I could use an interior decorator. Okay, let me keep going. So I have a soft agreement with the Alley Forney Center to also provide rooms for housing insecure LGBTQ youth who will be trained to provide services to the elders, oh, cooking and preventative therapies, therapist care, HHA, whatever they want. This is beautiful, Clint. I think this is very nice. So I'm starting it in the Bronx. I'm making no money off this. All profits will go towards uh, creating more or subsidize their rent. Oh, this is beautiful, Clint. I'm not sure where this is, is right now or where you are, how far you into it. But baby, regardless of anything, one thing about our community, you will find a lot of those who are going through a lot of things personally. And we have a lot of resources around us, a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations that are helping up by attending our events in these balls and give us the you know information or pamphlets or stuff that we need so we can either stay safe or continue living our fabulous lives. So I I like this, Clint. Uh, if, if you're there, you're getting one of these. That's bad. Um, here's the question, though. <laughs> you went through it. I understand it. There was a good one. So here's the question. So finally, the question. I would love to honor a historic, innovative, and leader from the ballroom scene with one of these homes. But how should I best find them? Is there organization or individual or who could help me choose an approach? O-M-G. I got the right person for you. And you're in the Bronx. This is amazing. And it just popped up in my head right now. Okay. Let me give you a quick synopsis. Before I was this fabulous, amazing, famous ass dancer and host, <laughs> I was working for a nonprofit organization to HIV testing and counseling and youth group facilitation. So I was kind of around this kind of field of, you know, making sure people were making the right choices and staying safe and testing and all that jazz. Um, now, I say this to say, I used to work at a organization in the Bronx, and my boss during that time now has his own organization, and his name is Sean Coleman. Shout out to him. Sean Ebony, the icon, who walks trans man realness and is real as hell, opened up his own nonprofit organization in the Bronx called Destination Tomorrow. So if you want to go find some information and figure out who to go to, and by the way, he's 
an icon in the scene. I believe he could be a little bit higher. So Sean, don't, 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 don't get me, Sean. Don't get me. And tell your wife I love her too. <laughs> don't get me. But um, Sean Coleman, he works there at Destination Tomorrow. He created the whole organization and it's been there within a past kind of like five years and that's a perfect place for you to go because he has the elders from the community of my community that attend there and also do different workshops or facilitates or go there for services as well too so destination tomorrow and it's located in the bronx if i'm corrupt uh, correct 149th and third avenue around that whole shopping mix you know what i'm talking about if you're in the bronx <laughs> uh but still sean coleman Destination Tomorrow, that's a perfect and amazing place. And by the way, I support you for doing that. Because Clint, I'm going to say one more thing before I go. And this is the last thing. I'm actually doing the same thing out here in Los Angeles. I have the LA room and board that I'm actually working with. And what we're trying to do is, is get our homeless youth, a part of the ballroom community, out into some homes and services. And we have now have a place that's out in, I believe, is Westwood. And we got a few participants that we brought in. So, you know, for those who ain't got anything or didn't have a homeless and needed a place, and we provided them with that. So shout out to LA Room and Board and working with the House of Basquiat and teaming up with us so we can make sure that our community stays safe all the time. Because this is one of those communities that, that experiences definitely with this from our youth and young adults. So we have now a chance to work with uh, amazing organizations and also inform us and help us to make our community better. So um, shout out to LA Room and Board and thank you for working with us. And I also shout you out, Clint, because the more we do for our community, it's a better change you can have. And I wish I was doing this in New York City. I'm doing it now here in LA, but New York City, you do your thing. Sean Coleman, Destination Tomorrow, you got your answer. Ow. And keep telling them about boring throwbacks about me on my clips. <laughs> thank you, Clint. And that was pretty good. That was pretty good. The questions weren't bad. Uh, you know I want to do a part two to this, right? And the only way that that's going to happen is if you send those questions because y'all got to ask the icon because I got some answers. And I think I did pretty good. So if you want to send your questions, you can go to Apple, you can go to Spotify, even YouTube and send those questions through. Even throw in the comments, like, like let me know what's good. But if you really want to get into the source, you can go to dayshawn.show and you'll see that tab that says ask the icon and you click it and send a message right on through. Because I want to know what y'all want to know. That's what I want to know. So send them through. Like, I'm here for it. Okay. The next episode, you really got to get into it because we're doing Honey Part 2. And if you quit Part 1, it got real good and so lengthy. So catch it. Next one, Honey Balenciaga. You already know what to do. I'm out of this. You know the vibe. I got out.